Good morning. How are we doing today? This is James Sweeney, aka Split Suit. Welcome back to another video. And today we're going to go through a quiz that we recently did on this channel. We're going to talk about what the spot was, what you guys said you would do in this situation, and what I think is the correct answer, and of course, why. First and foremost, I want to say thank you to Will for sending this hand in and letting us kind of dissect it and have some fun with it. So thank you very much. Thank you to you if you participated in this quiz. Honestly, anytime you participate in things like this, it helps videos like this exist in the first place. And I need a little truth disclaimer here. So here's what happened. I already recorded this video, edited this video, released this video, and very quickly some of y'all kindly pointed out that, hey, Split, the math looks a little bit off. And y'all were 100% correct. So I am not above making mistakes. I make them. It's very important to admit when you make a mistake. So here's what I did. I stripped the video down as soon as I realized it and said, okay, I'm going to re-record this, re-explain it. The math was correct in some assumption sets, but not all. I didn't explain it particularly well. So this is going to be a very quick video to kind of fix that and also go through what I wanted to talk about in the first place. So thank you if you kind of saw the first incorrect version. Thank you so much for your patience. And without further ado, let's talk about this spot and this hand. Okay, so let's start by looking at the hand in question. This is from Live12. Will opens on the button, and Will is a self identified lag. Says he opens pretty much all of his buttons. Okay, no problem. Nit decides to three bet. Will felt very confident that this was going to be jacks plus ace queen plus. Really no funky stuff outside of that. Okay, and Will decides to call. Now, the spot in question is this Nit decides to check. Remember, after three betting, and then Will decides to just start firing bullets. So, fires the flop, Nit decides to check call, Nit checks the turn, Will fires again, Nit decides to call. On the river, fills up that flush draw, Nit checks, and Will is here deciding what he wants to do. And this is also where the quiz ends, and at this point, you have three options. You could check this behind, you could bet $100, or you could go all in. So, take a moment, think about what you would do in this situation, and then push play when you're ready, and we'll talk about what everyone else said they would do in this spot. Now, truth be told, the answers here didn't really shock me in the slightest. After about a thousand responses, 68% of y'all said you would check this behind, 22% said they would go all in, and 10% said they would bet 100 bucks here. So checking behind, most popular option, and honestly, the option that I'm going to go with as well, and I'll talk about why in a moment. But starting off, betting 100 bucks, I don't really see what that option does, right? If we bet 100 bucks, do we get called by a bunch of second best hands, you know, extra ones? I don't think so. Does it create any extra fold equity to Jack's plus? I don't think so. I don't really see what the heck that bet and bet size specifically is accomplishing, and as such, I just get rid of that option. So it's really between checking behind and going all in. And Will even said in the write-up that this is just turning his hand into a bluff, right? He assumes that when he goes all in that this is just turning his hand into a bluff, and I'm very much inclined to agree. I don't think we're getting looked up by second best hands. I don't think there's a lot of like naked ace high that's going to continue here. So we're really just turning tens into a bluff. And at that point, the question is, do we ever get like over pairs? to fold here. What is this really doing? Is this good? Is this bad? So what I want to do is start by looking at the math really, really quickly, show you what goes into this spot and how to quickly visualize it. That way, when you find yourself in a similar situation in real time, you at least have a starting point and can say, okay, this probably looks good, or eh, maybe I'll just check this behind, cut the bluff and be done with it. So to help us proof this math, and to make sure I actually do it correctly this time, I did create a very, very quick and easy tool. This is totally free. I'll leave a link for it in the description box if you want it, and I would definitely suggest following along if you're interested in this kind of exploration, particularly if you've never really done stuff like this before. But at the end of the day, we have to remember a couple of different things. When we get here, we have two options. That's what we need to compare. We need to compare the value of checking to the value of firing, which one's going to be better, that's the line that we're going to take. The other thing that I have to really clearly specify is the math is a simple framework. Every single person, I shouldn't say every single person, but most of us are going to come with slightly different assumptions, different assumptions about what villain's going to call with, what villain's going to get to the river with, how many commas of this, that, or the other thing, frequencies of calling versus folding, how our hand performs. What I need you to understand is that you can come up with assumption sets that make checking clearly the best option. You can also come up with assumptions that's to make shoving clearly the best option. So if you are going to specify, hey, I think this is plus EV to shove, totally cool. But please make sure to lay out your assumptions. That way we can actually mathematically proof and say, yeah, for sure. Or eh, maybe we need to go back and rethink that a little bit. 
So let's start by pulling up that tool, plugging in some simple numbers and going to work and showing you what's going on. So on the left, we have the value of betting. On the right, we have the value of checking. Okay, very, very simple. The pot size right this moment is $335. And while yes, here it did shove in for 248, the effective stack is only 213. So that is going to be our shove size, pot size 335, easy from there. So again, based upon the assumption set that you have, this can go from really good firing to really, really bad firing very, very quickly. So let's talk about what goes into it. And I'm gonna start by coming up with an assumption set. And this is the assumption set that I think is probably most close to true. And that is that when the knit gets to the river, he's doing so with a range of hands that is incredibly strong. I don't think ever folds because if you think about it at this point, the knit's getting 2.6 to one on a call. I don't think the knit's going away at this point. That's just my assumption. Again, if you think it's different, then clearly you should plug that in and see what's going on here. But at the end of the day, I think the knit is getting here with over pairs. So that's jacks, queens, kings, aces, all of those crush us. And I don't think any of them are gonna fold. And that's 24 combos total. And I think the knit can have a ace king of diamonds and he's queen of diamonds. So that's two more combos, but it beats us. And I don't think it's folding. So with that in mind, let's plug a couple of things in. So the value for betting is this. If we bet and we get called, do I think I ever win? No, again, I think I'm getting called by Jax Plus, by the flushes, and as such, 0% chance of winning if we end up getting called. And how often do I think my opponent is folding when we fire it all in? Well, 0% of the time, right? I think they're getting to the river only with those combinations. I think all of them are continuing, and as such, nothing is folding. So the value of betting in that situation is negative 213. Well, that's not particularly good. So what's the value of checking back? Because again, we're comparing what's better, betting, and we're just looking at shoving, or checking this behind. So the value of checking this behind, well, the pot is 335 and the combinations we lose to are the 26 over pair, I'm sorry, 24 over pairs, 26 total, we include those two flushes, ace, king of diamonds, ace, queen of diamonds, and combinations we beat zero. Cause again, we thought they got to the river with nothing that we do well against. So the EV of checking in this scenario is zero. Well, which of these is higher, zero or negative 213? clearly zero. And as such, that's why I think checking is going to be the better option in this scenario. Now let's take a moment and change the assumption set and see what happens. So in this situation, we just looked at, okay, what happens if we just get looked up by Jack's plus and the flushes? Okay. Again, we're assuming no fold equity against those over pairs. And based upon the fact that the knit is getting 2.6 to one on a call, I think that's probably pretty fair to assume, but we'll talk about that in a moment as well. In this situation, let's make a different assumption. Let's say that the Nick gets here with full combinations of Jacks plus and full combinations of Ace King and Ace Queen. Maybe they decide to go into check call mode on the flop, the board double paired on the turn, and they say, you know what? I'll take Ace King or Ace Queen high for one more street and see what happens, thinking maybe you're kind of on the good bluffy side of the spectrum, which maybe that's true. <laughs> so let's just say that that's the, the assumption we're running with for the moment. I don't agree with that, but let's just say that it is. That way you can proof it and I show you what goes into it. So we still lose to the same combinations, right? We still lose to all 26, all the over pairs, jacks plus, and the ace, king, and diamonds, ace, queen, and diamonds. But let's say that they get here with full ace, king, and full ace, queen. Well, we know there's going to be 32 total combinations of ace, queen, plus, right? 16 of ace, queen, 16 of ace, king, and no blockers. We know two of those are going to be made flushes. So at the end of the day, we only beat 30 combinations when we get to the river here. Well, in that situation, we see that when we check back, it's gonna be plus $180. Okay, that's pretty great, sweet, no problem with that. But then we have to compare that to the value of shoving it in this spot. Well, here's what you have to assume very, very quickly. We have to assume, is villain ever going to continue on the river and check call with ace king or ace queen high, it's not diamonds. If no, right? So if he's only going to check call with the over pairs and the mid flushes, you're still never winning when you shove and get called. So you'd still have a 0% win percentage, but villain's going to be folding, right? Because if he's not calling with naked ace high, then clearly you're getting in a situation where he's probably folding these combinations. So how often is he folding? Well, right over here, we know that this is 54% of his range is going to be this ace high. So he's going to fold 54% of the time based upon the assumptions we're running. And now we can compare it. So betting is plus $83, checking back is plus $180, and as such, I would much rather check this behind. 
So in order for this to actually be more profitable to bet, you'd have to come up with situations where you're winning when called and and or villains folding a tremendous amount of the time. And oftentimes this is going to be a little bit difficult to do. So if you thought, going back to a different assumption set, say a slight tweak on the first one, say you thought that villain was always getting here with the... Uh, jacks plus and the made flushes so we thought that combinations we lose to all 26 of those but you thought that if you fire he'd fold some of them right if that's the case then this fold number starts to creep up and maybe you think he's going to fold 20 percent of his over pairs right this starts to creep slowly but surely but you notice how high this has to get in order for this to start going profitable and this is still only slightly profitable when compared to checking this really needs to be like quite high in order for us to have a situation where betting is clearly going to be better than checking based upon these assumption sets so again, you can come up with assumption sets where checking is clearly better, and I think that's going to be more commonplace. You can come up with assumption sets where firing like Will did is clearly going to be better, but you have to be very, very confident in that, and you have to know what goes into it. So again, the math itself, the framework of the math is static. What goes into comparing betting versus checking is static. What is very, very important is what are your assumptions, do your assumptions make sense, and then what do your assumptions come out to in terms of a mathematical outcome that lets you know, okay, this line is going to be better than maybe a different one. Now, I know this video is running a little long as is, but I still want to leave you with three major things. I know there are some GTO people watching this right now that are saying, no, no, no split. This can't be right. We have to have GTO frequencies. We have to turn our hand into a bluff some percentage of the time. If we just keep checking behind here, blah, 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 blah. Okay, first and foremost, chill out for a moment. Based upon the assumptions that I made, I made the assumption that the NIT pretty much has a frequency issue guaranteed right? The frequency issue is that they're continuing every single time we shove here. If that's the case, then why do we need to shove more bluffs, right? They have a frequency error and we take advantage of that imbalance by not bluffing more, right? If we have someone who folds every single time, then sure, we bluff everything into them. But in situations like this, where we think the knit is never folding, it makes no sense for us to throw extra bluffs into our range and to turn tens into a bluff here. We don't have to because this person already has a frequency error in their game. Let's take advantage of that, not put more fuel on the fire. Number two is that in Will's write-up, Will said this, since I opened my button so wide and only called his three bet, I figured the flop nailed my range much more than the nits. Okay, so let's go back to the flop. And in this situation, nit checks. Right, you can have some really big monsters in this situation. I 100% agree with you. You can have 10-9 and 9-8 and ace-nine suited. 100% agreed. But you can also have a lot of other hands as well, right? You can have queen-jack and ace-10 and king-queen and, and all these other funky combinations of hands that clearly are not super, super strong. So yes, you can have more nuts in your range than the nit can, but in no way, shape, or form does that necessarily certainly mean the nit's somehow going to start finding the full button a ton of the time. And that leads me into my last and major point. The assumption set that I came up with on the river, based upon what the nit would get to the river with, how often I think that's folding, is largely based upon the line, and more specifically the bet sizes that took place leading up to that point in the first place. So whenever you're exploring a river situation or a turn situation, Always go back and explore the earlier streets and see if maybe you made an error somewhere along the way. So here's what happened, right? Will opens the button, knit three bets, hero calls. Okay, nothing questionable about that. But in this spot, Will decides to fire and fires almost for pot on the flop. Knit continues. On the turn, double pairs the board, knit checks, hero fires again. And the issue here is the bet size. Right, The bet size is massive. We went from almost pot on the flop to almost pot on the turn, and we crossed the $100 threshold. In live games especially, the $100 threshold is a very important number. When someone like a nit especially says, yep, I'm going to call 100 bucks," you should be petrified because they're essentially saying, yeah, I am definitely serious about my hand, and if they're serious about their hand, that sure should mean that they probably don't want to fold now or later. So in the write-up, Will also said that the Nick tank called before calling the turn and also before calling the river shove. And yeah, when the Nick tank calls here and again crosses the $100 threshold, I think you're in a point where they're pretty much saying, yeah, I'm not folding, so don't bother trying to make me fold. 
So here's the real thing and the, the real issue, in my opinion, is that if Hero had bet here for smaller, let's just say the hero is for sure going to turn his hand into a bluff. I don't necessarily agree with that by any stretch, but let's just say the hero is going to make that determination early on. Why not bet here for something like 25 or 30? Because when you do that and get called, first and foremost, you're probably going to call by a little bit of a different range. And then also by the time you get to the turn, you don't have to bet so large. So you're not crossing the $100 threshold when you fire the turn and get action. And that also then means that the range that they get to the river with is probably a little bit wider, probably more hands that can consider folding. And also your bet size on the river could then be big enough to actually get that fold equity that you probably need right? The issue here is that based upon the sizing that took place, by the time we get to the river and make this punch, right, Nit's getting a pretty darn good price. And I don't think that's going to favor us when it comes to that fold equity and or thinking that the Nit's here with a range of hands that we can somehow get value from. So I really think the line up to this point is what created this issue, right? If we had gone something like 25 or 30 on the flop and then a little bit smaller on the turn, all of a sudden we might be able to overbet the river and we might actually be able to get pocket jacks to consider folding some percentage of the time. And again, you can make some assumption sets where you assume that villain is going to fold some of those over pairs or get to the river with a slightly different range. Again, the assumptions can change this spot very, very quickly. What's very important is that you make an assumption set. You look at it. You say, what's better, checking here or shoving here? And I'm not shocked that we end up shoving and get snapped off by aces. Yeah, I know that's what he tank called. But this isn't shocking to me, and this is something that's very, very important, knowing when to turn your hand into a bluff, when it's right, when it's wrong. And in this situation, I think checking is going to be far better than betting, especially given the line and the sizes leading up to the river situation. And that is going to wrap it up for this video. Will, thank you so much for sending this hand in. And just for the record, you mentioned the write-up that you just turned 18. This is really only your second time playing live one too. I mean, major props to you, my man. You're already thinking about when to turn hands into bluffs. You're already thinking about running big barrels. You got bigger balls than I did at 18. So high five to you. Keep up the good work. You got a bright future ahead of you if you keep this kind of work up. And a special thank you to you as well if you participated in this quiz. If you didn't, no stress. We'll be getting another one done probably when I get back from Siri. So probably in July-ish, maybe in August. But if you have thoughts or anything in the meantime, please don't hesitate to let me know. And again, thank you everyone who pointed out that my math was incorrect in the first take of this video. My apologies. I will definitely make sure to double check that more often in the future. That way I don't present you guys with my brain farts. So again, thank you so much for hanging out. If you need anything, let me know. Otherwise, if you liked this tool, please be sure to download it. I'll leave a link in the description box. And if you need anything in the meantime, let me know. No. Otherwise, as always, thank you so much for hanging out today. And as always, good luck out there and happy grinding.